uh, questions about migration, admixture, lifetime mobility even, depending on the scale uh, we phrase our research questions on. Potentially, we might be interested in phenotypes, but primarily we're working with genetic variation that is selectively neutral. So we're not looking at genes per se. Okay? We're looking at genetic variation that's floating around in the genome on, on which there is no selective pressures. There's no natural selection acting on the frequencies of these genetic variants. So they, it's a neutral marker. Well, we look at multiple, up to millions of nuclear markers that are selectively neutral. The only uh, reason they change in frequency is by chance. So we can look at demography really quite efficiently. So what is the ancient DNA uh, revolution we're currently in? Well, I'll, I'll go through this quickly. Uh, over the past 10 or 20 years, we've become really, really good at uh, knowing how to sample maybe a skeleton or other types of archaeological remains to um, efficiently extract any ancient DNA that may be still preserved. Um, we, we, we also have developed really good methods for recovering ultra-short, highly damaged and fragmented ancient DNA molecules in the lab. Uh, we can also uh, we have access to massively parallel next-generation sequencing, meaning we can generate billions of sequences in one go. When I did my PhD 15 years ago, I, I generated something like 2,000 sequences over, over a whole PhD. Uh, this day I can generate a billion over a weekend, right? So it, it's, it's a, been a massive increase in technology. Therefore, we can access autosomal genomes, which are huge, right? So 3.2 times 2 billion base pairs. The mitochondrial genome is 16,000 base pairs. So it tells you something about the scale we're working with. And we have good bioinformatics methods. We can map, we have good reference genomes. We can look for uh, patterns in the data that's typical for ancient DNA. So we can authenticate the, the molecules we work with to say that with some confidence that they're ancient and not modern contaminants, and so on and so on. We have new analytical methods. And these are the kind of uh, key characteristics, right? So uh, we have a good understanding of the degradation pathways of ancient DNA molecules. They fragment. We understand the chemical uh, properties of that process. Uh, the second thing here is the <clears throat> deamination. So this, this uh, false, the manifestation of chemical damage into false mutations in the sequencing data. But we actually make use of that now to authenticate the molecules. So we can circumvent all of these issues with ancient DNA molecules to make sure that we're actually working with, with the real stuff. And that's what we did in this paper. Um, it's data that I generated as a postdoc uh, in Stockholm, actually a few years ago, uh, when I was working as a postdoc, uh, actually at U University of Aberdeen, together with uh, uh, Kate Britton, Gordon Noble, and uh, Christina Donald is in, in, involved in this project. And then uh, I didn't get to publish the data, but I passed it on to my PhD student at John Moores University at that time, Adeline Morris. And she, she did some fantastic analyses of, of these genomes. And we had a number of samples, primarily from London Lynx, um, but we also had access to uh, some remains from Balintor. Um, so what did we do then? We, well, we sequenced a bunch of uh, DNA and then we map it against the reference genomes and we look for typical damage to confirm it's ancient and all of those things. And then we can look at some summary statistics. Two of the genomes, um, if we look at the autosomal uh, DNA, and remember this is 3.2 billion base pairs, we've covered each of those bases in the reference genome we used to map our data onto 16 times. That's a lot of, lot of, lot of data uh, we generated there. And um, another genome, we covered all the reference bases, bases on average 2.43 times. So we have coverage of all, all the bases in the reference genome. So we have complete genomes for two individuals uh, in this data set. Other individuals, we have far uh, less coverage. We, we, we found less DNA. Uh, but nonetheless, we could extract and uh, sequence uh, the well, we'll determine the mitochondrial and Y chromosomal uh, haplotypes. So th these are the lineage markers. So you can tell you something about maternal kinship and, and those types of things. However, because we had access to these uh, really high uh, quality genomes, uh, we could do what's called imputation. So we could statistically infer the autosomal genotypes, so genetic variants across the genome. And uh, we could later then phase those into individual chromosomes. And from there, we could infer what's called IBD. And we co-analyzed all of this with 8,300 uh, previously published modern and ancient genomes. So what is IBD? IBD is simply uh, identity by descent, and it's easily um, shown here in this figure, uh, we have two cousins here, a male in a square and the female in the circle. Uh, and this little segment of, uh, well, one each of their chromosomes is shared. They can trace that ancestry 
down to this chromosome, so a shared common ancestor. Where in this genealogy is their shared uh, common ancestor? Well, we skip this generation, uh, the second generation here, because they don't share an ancestor uh, directly in that generation. Instead, their most recent common ancestor on that stretch of the, of the shared uh, chromosomal segments is this chromosome in this male individual uh, three generations, well, two generations past, right? And this is just a, a, a very simplified example, right? <clears throat> Imagine we can do this across millions of markers uh, in the genome, and each of these markers, uh, um, well, they, they segregate independently, so we can treat them as individual data points across the genome. So a genome is not just a genome, it's in fact millions of independent data points. A genome captures uh, information about potentially hundreds uh, of genetic ancestors, okay? So it's, uh, it's a big sample size, actually, to, to, hope to, to have a single genome. We can also look at this farther back in time, across generations, right? And because of this genetic recombination I mentioned, uh, these little shared chunks of chromosomes farther back in time get smaller and smaller, right? So at a certain point, we hit a limit where we can statistically detect these IBD segments across time period. Um, and we decided that one centimorgan, about one million base pairs, so it's quite a long chunk, but relatively small, um, it approximates approximately um, uh, common ancestors living approximately 15 generations in the past or about 1,500 years ago, if we make some assumptions about generation times and uh, various things like that. But it, at, at this point, we thought, oh, actually, that corresponds kind of well with the time period of the Pictish genomes uh, we're working with, right? About um, 600 AD or so, okay? So we tried to look for IBD um, segments shared with uh, present-day individuals, present-day groups across the British Isles, but also against previously published ancient genomes that are somewhat contemporary. Uh, well, first up, okay, so I'll go, go through the results uh, quickly. Uh, so we have those two coverage, high coverage, well, good coverage genomes, um, and I'll tell you more about the results in, in just a moment. If we look at the mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosomal DNA, we can only obtain one Y chromosome, uh, so that doesn't tell us anything about in, in terms of comparative data uh, within London links, that context. Uh, but that individual carried uh, um, R1B uh, haplotype, which is common, so that we can state it's consistent with known genetic variation from the British Isles, both present and ancient. Mitochondrial DNA tells us that none of the individuals that we sequenced from London Lynx uh, were maternally related, or at least close, there were no direct maternal links, which gives us um, at least an indication of uh, a first insight to the uh, potential biological relatedness and therefore also potentially social kinship uh, to that site. That's something I want to keep working on uh, in the future, generating more uh, and better coverage autosomal genome to really dig, um, drill into that particular question. Uh, we had some, unfortunately, some compromised data in two of the autosomal genomes of London Lynx, uh, or two samples, but uh, I'm happy we managed to identify uh, those types of, those issues with some very stringent um, quality controls. Right, I'm dragging out of time. See, I'm used to giving two hour lectures, so I'm just, yeah, all right. Um, so what about the autosomal DNA? So the first question we ask, where did, did the two uh, good coverage Pictish genomes fit within the genetic landscape, the genomic landscape of uh, present-day uh, Northwestern Europeans and also ancient, somewhat contemporary? So we compiled uh, the light colored um, or the kind of the colored, the small dots here uh, represents various present-day populations. Here we have Scandinavia, um, up here we have uh, uh, yeah, okay, I think it's G uh, Germany, but down here we have England, Scotland, uh, Wales, uh, and Orkney Islands, okay? Um, and we contrasted this against a bunch of Iron Age genomes and so on from Scandinavia. So we do find genetic continuity within these regions to the present day, roughly. Uh, so where do the uh, two Pictish genomes cluster? Well, they cluster on top of genetic variation similar to, um, shall we say, Scotland, Orkney, and so on. So that's consistent with, with the idea that at least these two Pictish genomes share uh, genetics, well, they were genetically similar to present-day populations. So there's the degree of genetic continuity. So there's nothing controversial in that statement, really. The, the, ne the next question is then, 
how do the ancient genomes cluster among themselves relative to this, this genetic variation? And we begin to see some types of patterns, right? Uh, the red dots up here uh, are Anglo-Saxon or early medieval English. And we know uh, from other types of uh, ancient DNA studies that there, were, there was a great degree of migration from Scandinavian-like uh, type ancestries, which we approximate with present-day uh, Scandinavians up here. And that's consistent. We're replicating that signal. Um, here we have Viking Age Orcadians down here at this end, clustering relatively close with the two Pictish genomes. Uh, here we have two Viking Age genomes from Orkney that we know from previous studies were admixed with Scandinavian-like ancestry. So we replicate that signal. Because we can replicate these signals, we're very confident in our placement of the two Pictish genomes within this genomic landscape. But again, we can't really make any further statements um, in this context. Uh, uh, apart from visually comparing, right? So instead, we decided to look at these um, IBD sharing uh, things, and we can think about this in terms of networks, right? But if, if we extrapolate this across time and space and thousands of ancestors here and there, representing this in a network can be, become quite me messy. So we just counted up the number of um, events of shared IBD, and we quantify that. And we see that the Ballintor uh, genome and the London Lynx genome share far more uh, really short segments of, of IBD with present-day Orcadians, uh, Northern Irish individuals, individuals from Wales, Scotland, and uh, a little bit of England, but also France. That's not to say that there are no IBDs uh, sharing with other uh, reference populations, because the baseline we start with here is 200, okay? It's just that we see an elevation of shared IBD uh, with these present-day populations, suggesting genetic continuity. Right, and we, we included a bunch of other reference data too, so we replicated again the, the, a couple of Anglo-Saxons, share a lot of, lot of IBD with, with present-day Danish individuals and, and things like that. So again, we're, we're using other data as a kind of sanity check to replicate our, our signal. Uh, we extrapolated this to geography, right? And the green areas is where we find more IBD sharing. And we, we tend to see uh, what we interpret as a Western signal. There is more IBD sharing between the two Pictish genomes and present day populations in Northern Ireland, uh, Wales, uh, Western Scotland, and so on, right? And then we compare that against Anglo-Saxon genomes and so on, but I don't really have time to go into that. But the point here is that we're, we're, we're seeing a pattern to suggest that there is more genetic continuity in what we could perhaps, we don't use that term in the paper, but maybe the, what, what's commonly known as the Celtic fringe or so. I, I, th I think at least, I think that that's the term, right? Uh, uh, present day Wales, um, uh, Scotland and so on, uh, but not with England. So there's a drastic reduction in the IBD sharing with England. Instead, Anglo-Saxons are primarily contributing a lot of that ancestry. That's what we can see. And we broke that down to individual level. What we learned by looking at individual genomes instead of pooling data is that there's a lot of heterogeneity in this IBD sharing. There's a high degree of stochastic stochasticity. Therefore, we should be careful with these generalized statements that we uh, attempted first by pooling multiple genomes from the same cultural uh, context. Instead, um, this IBD method allows us to look at individual variation um, on a fairly uh, detailed scale. And I suggest that that's a, a really good starting point uh, to break down these kind of meta narratives that are being produced in larger ancient, ancient DNA studies. This IBD method, it allows us to really drill into this uh, genetic variation and look for um, individual uh, life histories, essentially. Uh, okay, then we, we asked the question about uh, IBD sharing between ancient individuals. So we took the Picts and compared them against uh, Iron Age genomes and, and uh, Anglo-Saxons and so on. Um, and we do find a lot of uh, relatively large um, chunks of, I well, sharing of relatively large chunks of IBD, 6 million base pairs, instead of counting up 1 million base pairs. And as we learned from my little uh, schematic, the larger the chunk, right, the, the more recent uh, your common ancestor between those two, uh, between that sharing event took place or, or lived, right? So we can approximate and we can begin to drill into the shared common ancestors of pairs of individuals cross-culturally. And we do see a lot of connection cross-culturally. So here we access a shared segment of a chromosome, we're effectively identifying a sh an unknown shared genetic ancestor between those two individuals. And that's a, that was a real living human. So we, we go from this broad genetic diversity on a population level down to actually identifying segments that tells us something about a, a real person at some point. So, so we bridge this Meta narrative, this abstract way of thinking about population genetics with actual individuals. We, we, we will never be, be able to identify those individuals, but we see remnants of them in the genetic data. 
So I propose that we can begin accessing life histories of genomes uh, and compare that against you know, cross-cultural data and break down these concepts of the Picts. The Picts, uh, in fact, uh, constituted multiple genetic ancestries uh, and it was not a, a genetic hom homogenous population. Okay, that's the kind of conclusion. Right, so to discuss and, con and conclude, our data hint at a Western affinity Ongoing research by Lucy Coster and Kate Britton and, and uh, um, uh, colleagues in, in the room uh, look at strontium stable isotope data, the chemical signatures from teeth to um, infer lifetime mobility. So combining this type of data with, with uh, our type of data will be very, very powerful. And maybe there is something to this Western affinity. We don't know. Um, and I'm not the expert to, to, to talk about that from an archaeological perspective anyway. Um, but anyway, we have Gordon and Nick, Nick, Nick Evans and so on who, who can gain, um, provide us really interesting insight into that. Okay, so in terms of Pictish, uh, it's a complex entity in terms of biological ancestry. Um, it's relatively similar on a broad scale. As we see, they cluster together with other, other kind of uh, Orcadian genomes and so on, slightly separated. Um, so on that macro scale, there is a degree of clustering within the Pictish genomes, but if we drill into the detail, we find a lot of heterogeneity too. Even cross-cultural, um, uh, shall we say, IBD sharing, so shared recent common ancestors uh, to the exclusion of other Picts, right? So, so it's really, really um, intriguing level of detail. We do need, need more genomes to see how this pans out. I'm interested in looking at this from a kind of bro broader kind of network perspective. Anyway, at London Lynx in particular, there's high, uh, well, there's evidence of high mitochondrial diversity, but uh, so no direct maternal relatedness. Does that um, mean we're dealing with female exogamy? I don't know, right? Uh, that's consistent with female exogamy. So that's something, again, I want to drill deeper into and ask more questions about. And again, strontium and oxygen isotope might be important here. Uh, and ultimately, what I think our paper shows is that, is that we can uh, essentially take on the postmodern critique of ancient DNA and break down these meta narratives and start asking ar archaeologically relevant questions, uh, perhaps. Okay, so bridging the large scale with the uh, small scale um, and looking at individuals and placing those individuals within broader context. So we change the perspective a little bit. Uh, and uh, that's the take home message, uh, I think. Okay, thank you so much.